uh, when I was working um, at Accenture, they finally had to put a team of 18 people to replace me. Wow. And India is a happening place now, you know, like you can build uh, world class uh, businesses and you don't uh, feel like, you know, you can only execute it from the West. You can do everything from India now. Even people ask us, our structure is uh, we have only 10 people in uh, London. The entire team is based out of uh, India. If you have money, India is the best place to live. You get, you know, five maids and a driver and everything is taken care of. In the West, you can't do that. In India, if I think, you know, somebody gives me a choice, you have exactly same career prospects and what you can do in one place versus the other. And whether you want to take Bangalore or Coimbatore, I will take uh, Coimbatore at current moment. Hi, this is Siddharth Alwalia and welcome to The Neon Show. Today's guest bootstrapped his company from one customer in Hong Kong to thousands, including Shell, Boeing and IKEA. He dreams of creating a Silicon Valley in Coimbatore and help build the city's first SaaS unicorn in the process. We welcome Koei.co's founder Saruna Kumar to The Neon Show. I would also like to thank the sponsors Prime Venture Partners for sponsoring The Neon Show. Hope you enjoy it. Karuna, welcome to the Neon Show. So excited to have you here. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Siddharth. I'm a really big fan of uh, your podcast all the way from 100x Entrepreneurs. I've been watching for a long time. Uh, in fact, like, you know, some of the things I've... Yours is a bit longer format, but still I enjoy it. Like, you know, on the weekends, I typically sit and watch some of the episodes. And that's how I got connected to you. And I'm yes. really delighted to be here. You know, I didn't know like, uh, you know, I'll be sitting here and speaking. Oh, thank you here. so much. You know, like, uh, thank for, you. Thank you very for much. Traveling, especially to Bangalore for the podcast. And, you know, you and I have shared a special relationship. I've interacted with you many times now. And you're also now an investor in Neon Fund. So, so glad to, to bring, you know, somebody who has known Neon more personally uh, as well. Uh, Sarla, I would love to start with your childhood, right? What are the earliest childhood memories that have shaped, become who you are today? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I keep telling this uh, story because I come from uh, like a, a typical middle class yeah. family in India. So I'm the, uh, I got two siblings, two brothers, and I'm the eldest one. And right from my young age, like uh, my father runs a small shop uh, in the native town called... Does he still run it? Uh, no, no, he's retired now. Uh, but, uh, you know, like uh, when we were younger, like, yeah. uh, so he used to run a small shop. And town uh, called? Met, it's called Metupolayam. Okay. It's actually uh, 30 kilometers away from Coimbatore. But if, whoever, if you want to visit Uti, then you need to cross uh, okay. Metupolayam. Because it's the foothills of Uti is uh, this town. Okay. It's, it, it, it's a small town, Metupolayam. So that is where I've been uh, grow, uh, grown up. Uh, my dad's business is very simple, you know, like uh, uh, you might recollect from your younger age, like a uh, picture framing, right? Yes. The puja pictures. We have so like, many friends here in the office. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. You know, the the the, the, the Ganapati and yeah. Saraswati and all yeah. those pictures. It's a very small yeah. business. That's uh, And uh, right from when I was in 12 or something, uh, I need to get involved in the business uh, because uh, my father was exploring other uh, sure. op op opportunities. And, and you don't have accounts and anything like you can't leave there just the employees to and because they can just uh, sell something and pocket the money because you won't have any trace of and you were doing it after school after school you know like uh, that's a two, my regular 2 p.m work. keep your bag in the office have your lunch at the office and <laughs> no 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 not that crazy uh, you know like normally i'll come back home my father will be waiting to pick me up okay uh, to be honest i hated that when <laughs> the, at that age because you come and you go and play with yeah, uh, yeah. your friends right but uh, that's my regular routine and that's how I've been I grown up. And I, that continued all the way, you know, like uh, uh, even to my higher education. And even when I went to university, I think my dad, uh, the criteria is something like, you know, I will be able to come back and they can carry on uh, in the, on the business side. Uh, today, you know, I can relate all those learnings, uh, whatever you had learned uh, during that period uh, is uh, transforming today. Uh, one of the thing is uh, exposure to dealing with money at a young age because you're, you know, like yeah. a, it, the principles are same, only the, the numbers are different. Or the scale uh, is the different. The scale is different, right? <laughs> uh, so I feel like, you know, even today, like I, I, I feel I, I tell people like, you know, it's very important to uh, teach kids uh, sure. at a very younger age. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, in, in, in our family, like I got two boys and we all the time, you know, we talk about everything. Probably my boys are pretty 
shaped up i will say like they know what are the marketing challenges yeah. and people challenges and everything so that contributed uh, significantly uh, so one more example is uh, so we also sell uh, window glasses yeah. you know like uh, when you construct a new 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 home you need uh, the glasses sure. for the windows right so we were also selling that so for that the way we used to get business is you need to you need to pay commission to carpenters yeah so only when then they will bring the yeah. business to you and that is the same like uh, what we call partnership yeah. model now like uh, at, at scale yeah. like you know like exactly same what are the nuances you know how do you deal with them how do you make them happy yeah. all those principles it uh, applies so i think maybe you know like without even i realizing uh, that uh, younger age exposing to business uh, contributed significantly to uh, where we are today you know maybe you know just the bootstrap business and very frugal no i won't say very frugal uh, still we invest and grow yeah. uh, at the same time but uh, handling money is uh, it's one of the biggest learnings uh, from that yeah got the the other thing that i want uh, to discuss with you is you have been away from india almost 22 years now it's actually 50 50 now i am 46 so yeah. i lived uh, uh first year, 23 years in india and second yeah. 23 years in london yeah. and your first job in london was fidelity no um i i joined i the first job was a was a mumbai based uh, indian body shopping got company it. so that's how i got the job I, i was with them only for one year and then the they the place where they deployed me the the, the client uh, they basically uh, bought me out i think okay. they, uh, that's what happened uh and it was a company called march first it was an american okay. company but later bought by logica and then cgi okay. uh, yeah uh, that was my first job and then i joined accenture after that uh for 3 years and reality was uh, 2007 to 2010 yeah i think a uh, small stint at uh, microsoft so four companies in 10 years or i believe you you always wanted to start up your own business right so even at fidelity you were doing first 5 days a week then you reduced it to 4 days and then 3 days and then finally you quit correct <laughs> right yeah i won't say like you know like uh, uh, whether it was a very strong uh, aspiration to sure. go and start whether i don't know whether that was there uh, but uh, right from the young age i was always doing one thing or the uh, or the other uh even uh, uh, 97 something like you know i was working uh, uh as a as a trainer uh, in one of the institutions similar to aptech sure. kind of thing nit and all these yeah nit aptech uh, they this was a local institute uh, back when it was uh, so in, big right because yeah. everybody It's wanted many, to learn too many too many every street will have one uh, <laughs> training institute right yeah. so i was working for a company called nuva systems in uh, coimbatore and even that time i was trying to build a training software uh, to yeah. sell to i was always doing bits and pieces uh, but uh, this one you know i saw an opportunity like we'll probably talk about it the first product how the idea came uh, and then i i saw the idea and then initially i was working only on the weekends for some time then i thought probably i can take it bit more serious and then i went to my manager and i said uh, the thing is you know even today like if you have a really good talent right like you you want to preserve them one way or yeah. the other and at that point i always always put 100% you know like it will be uh, uh when i was working um, at essenture like uh, they finally had to put a team of 18 people to replace me wow. like uh, you know <laughs> slow every because you're so passionate about uh, the problem space and even yeah. there won't be any spec- specification or anything you will go build so many things to help the people out there and eventually the thing i was i was building something like a, it's called a simulator uh, like uh, essenture one this biggest uh, contract for sure. healthcare in uh, uk so they are connecting every single doctors and hospitals uh, together yeah and there are so many vendors involved like uh, healthcare vendors and they they will come and deploy something and that will break the core sure. system and every time there's a lot of delay in testing and sure. everything so i built a simulator for all this uh, external vendors i just started as a hobby thing you know nobody asked me to yeah. do it i just started in the weekends and i was just uh, doing it and gradually that became like a core one of the core things for the entire uh, project that's like a few billion dollar worth of a project and finally essentially i had to put like 18 20 people to replace me 
uh, a similar thing uh, uh, happened and the reason i was telling is fidelity you know same i work uh, i never you know worried about uh, work uh, it's a it's just you know i did never felt like work you know i really enjoyed it i did yeah. something and then you're adding so much value to them and when i proposed you know like okay i want to do that they're very flexible and then i reduced it gradually four days and three days and i did it for like six or eight months and that is how i built the b1 of the product yeah so right now your boys are 13 and 16 uh, yeah i think 70 yeah they're the three years different 16 and 13 now yeah, yeah. And, and properly settled in london and uh, and you come back to india more and more often right so so do you feel that now the more exp- the expats that have moved outside india there's a feeling of i want to come back to india because w- what india lacked 20 years ago 23 years ago when you moved out it has made up for that um i think it's a kind of mixed uh, sentiments uh, for me like uh, i what i what i really wanted to do is moving forward once the boys you know maybe another few years they will go to university and uh, you know we have free time to decide how you wanted to do it i think the both uh, countries got its own pros and sure. cons there are certain things you really enjoy in uh, india and certain things you enjoy in uh, uh, the west so we probably will settle down more like uh, you know six months here six months there or like even depending on the boys they really want to go to us for the studies then probably we will shuttle between uh, three different uh, countries but definitely you know like a lot of things improved in the last 20 years at least from the opportunity side definitely no doubt you know india is a happening place now you know like you can build uh, world class uh, businesses and you can uh, that side 100% you know like you really you, know, you don't uh, feel like you know you can only execute it from the west you can do everything from india now even people ask us our structure is uh, we have only 10 people in uh, london the entire team is based out of uh, india you know sometimes people only use the engineering talent from india and the all other gtm teams will be out of uh, somewhere else but in our case everything is uh, we invest and we mentor and is it's all can be doable in india on that aspect definitely india is a better place now yeah and what changes in infrastructure that you have seen in india in the last 20 years because india shining has been a mantra for the last 30 40 years but can you share some concrete examples on like why india is shining right now uh, the one thing is talent definitely i think uh, we need to thank all this uh, consulting firms like infosys and tcs and wipro's uh, what they have done in the last uh, 20 30 years is what the talent pool what we are seeing now it's it's a generation right like uh, so 20 years ago you didn't have it like people were just getting into it and then um, and then they just uh, learning along but today uh, all the you know they all kind of experiences are there they they got potential to build any world class uh, product that definitely you know like uh, paid a significant uh, today in fact india became a powerhouse for uh, talent for the entire world right uh, so that is definitely is a positive side and also the infrastructure side uh, the at least the it infrastructure like you know you can get pretty much uh, everything like uh, high speed internet and those it even though it looks trivial but uh, they are the uh, pillars right uh, today 4g and probably i don't know whether 5g is available you know 4g's and 5g's are available you are connected all the time uh, the tech side you know like uh, everything is happening uh definitely on that aspect you know like a lot of improvements in the last 20 years but people also blame infosys tcs wipro for creating low cost it wages low cost slavery <laughs> right because uh, i graduated in uh, 2011 my first job was in amdocs mm. the tcs came to my campus with 3 lakh rupees of annual offer amdocs was paying 4.2 so i decided to join amdocs and even today tcs infosys play pay to fresher who are 22 to 24 year old 3 lakh rupees per annum okay yeah <laughs> i i don't know about the fact but uh, but maybe you know like i don't i don't know whether the 3 lakhs is applicable for uh, the across the spectrum or it could be for any, like, any fresher that they're taken okay so that's it but i, I i don't know how they can compete you know like if you want a cream of the cream right uh, you they need to pay they, they don't want cream <laughs> oh yeah i think that is their business model right it's like mcdonalds you know you ap- appreciate yes. the mcdonalds business the entire business model is like that uh, you know like okay they are 
only driven by student and they don't want to pay it's a, it's a it's a saying in the west i right? do you want to work for a mcdonald salary yeah. like because it's they always you know 10 dollar whatever the min- national minimum wage set by the government yeah. is what you will get on uh, mcdonalds and that is the business model uh, what they developed and mastered and that's uh, and scaled maybe the tcs infosys that is a, and we know like you know like uh, i don't want to name the company like it's a very famous company in coimbatore the accounts department they have a, they have a ceiling you know like i think uh, 5 lakhs or 4 lakhs or something like that's it you once you grow gradually i think they will start very low like 2 lakhs or something and then once they hit 4 lakhs you have an option either to continue at that or exit because they will start again from 2 lakhs yeah. and slowly build it up so we take people from there at uh, maybe from 4 to 6 lakhs and then they here we don't have like you know like they can grow all the way to 12 15 lakhs over a period of time and maybe that's a business model uh, of them so i think it's uh, very difficult to generalize but uh, you know like uh, but at the same time sure you know like uh, uh, these companies build uh, great talent uh, as well you know even to provide uh, uh, okay let's leave the uh, salary part right but once you have a infrastructure like you know your laptop and uh, software yeah. and uh, access to internet and uh, you yeah, then that is uh, invaluable like you know like uh, you probably won't uh, won't get it yeah. so i think in that aspect i'm pretty sure like uh, uh, they are the uh, starting point for a lot of people who are uh, building stuff now right these are only very few product companies uh, so all the today's all the product uh, uh, founders if you look at it if you go all the way back they would have worked in one of those companies at uh, at some point um, yeah so so you are right we can compare them to the mcdonalds of the west what mcdonalds did to the workforce and why uh, i think west has uh, so much ethics in their workforce right we see because the people 15 year old 14 year old start working in mcdonalds yeah. really early in their life That's and right. even while doing their college they try to earn working yeah. at mcdonalds starbucks correct so so they are building the talent factory for india no that's right you know even they might hire somebody at 3 lakhs but today's market i don't know how they can compete you know if somebody is really good they they can they won't stick around for more right you know like within a year they will find something as long as the, the drive is there they will fly and, and yeah. they don't want folks what it's such it was a joke in college in our college i believe many other colleges that they used to come in trucks <laughs> <laughs> to hire yeah no i think i think the different slabs right like uh, if you go to top colleges like uh, the tier 1 will be amazons and microsoft yeah, yes. paying like you know 25 lakhs for yeah. the intern and uh, yeah. and then the tier 2 comes at uh, below and and we are actually going up and up we the goal is you know we want to go as high as possible uh, financially possible uh, because uh, i personally believe quality matters there are you know um it's much more easier if you got a 10x guy you know like rather than putting 10, even five people to do that job yeah. you know like it uh, thinks everything is uh, is simple when you have 10x guy even internally i keep telling uh, people as a whatsapp as an example because uh, whatsapp when it was acquired by facebook uh, for 19 billion there were only 50 people you know so you really don't need uh, a lot of people even today like people ask me are you going to be like 600 people and no that's not not the goal you know like uh, yeah. we wanted to be 300 yeah. and get to yeah. 5x the revenue i think that is true for product companies right because customer pays you for the product not for people correct but in services company the arbitrage is the key they are paying us say a guy 20 dollars an hour and they are charging 200 dollars per hour for american client no, absolutely or, i think that is where you know we can't really compare you yeah. know like because they are uh, revenue model is based on yeah. headcount yeah. you know like how ch- the cheapest they can get yeah. and then add a markup and what they can do because you can't really compare against a product and service business because this is where you know um, it's very un- important to understand the business model because mcdonalds is very successful nobody is complaining because that is their business model it's, it's working and maybe tcs infosys that is the business model and that's uh, that's working they'll have multiple layers and at the bottom layer they're happy with that you know imagine getting paying 3 lakhs and getting paying 200 dollars a day or something it's a huge yeah their the revenue is 27 billion or something yes. <laughs> yeah. so so that's the arbitrage right? <laughs> so a, a person would they would get let's say 200 dollars per hour so for a 10 hours of a normal workforce person 
they are able to make 2000 dollars per day what even they don't pay in a month correct right. correct so, so i think but uh, there is no doubt that they have built india as a talent pool right because uh, india has always been an aspirational country yeah and uh, if we go back to our roots right we have been one of the most hard working people that's why we see right all the uh, the us big amazon except amazon microsoft sap everywhere there's an indian ceo yeah. and it's just not the indian ceos right because ceos are not created magically out of thin air absolutely yeah, <laughs> these yeah. are the indians who who slogged for 20 years at various leadership positions in that company proved their metal across proved their ability to work with different cultures sure. and then became uh, the ceo so i think a lot of factors combined right in the west indian have become the top leadership talent earlier it was a mix of american and chinese and it's now being replaced by indians and the second is that the ground level tel- talent is getting created here absolutely yeah yeah in india but uh, earlier one, one of the other things that i want to discuss you 20 years ago for all aspirational folks all the hard working folks the best ticket for a good life was uh, do your bachelor's here apply for masters outside india and aim for that better life is it still true today um i don't i don't think so uh, because uh, it's mo- most of them are more like a uh, economic uh, uh, migrants right like uh, you didn't have opportunities here for the for the skill set uh, what you have built up and you had a better uh, life outside but today the salaries are uh, on par really you know like uh, the, the top you go like uh, in fact you you your saving potential will be much much higher in india uh, than in the west because in the west it is kind of saturated uh, apart from very few roles uh, even uk like uh, still 100k is a very good salary 100000 pounds is a reasonably good salary and the top guys maybe you know 150 160 something like that and in India, it's one crore become normal, right? Like uh, at a, even a mid-manager and uh, at a at leadership level, it became normal. Here, okay, I don't know Bangalore, but in uh, tier two cities, you can get a high-end flat for uh, 20,000 rupees rent or something like that, 20, 30. So the savings potential is uh, quite huge. And also the lifestyle, the, the quality of life is also much uh, higher in India. If you have money, India is the best place to live. You get, you know, five maids and a driver and everything is taken care of. In the West, you can't do that. You know, like even when you're earning that kind of money, uh, you still need to vacuum your house and, you know, all those things, uh, challenges are there. So definitely uh, people are now probably thinking that's not the only route like before. Like, okay, I need to, that's the playbook people used to do, right? Uh, engineering and then whatever GRE, TOEFL, and then uh, one quick MS and then settle down in... Uh, in us but now definitely the opportunities are there and uh, you, you can be here okay the only there are few india specific downsides like uh, traffic and uh, the other other things but other than that i, I feel the quality of life is uh, much better here so if a company like koei existed in coimbatore 23 years ago you wouldn't have moved out out of india that is our pitch now, you know, like, okay, we all moved out of Coimbatore because nobody created that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And that is exact, that's a problem, you know, it's in, because if you look at it, Coimbatore got some of the top colleges in the country. Yeah. I think the, the PhDs and GCPs. It has 50 to 60 yeah. colleges, right? Yes, yeah, uh, some 60, 70 colleges and uh, some of them will come under the top 10 colleges yeah. in the country. So those, all those talent, you know, like... Uh, uh, once they're done, you know, like uh, they didn't have a choice. Either they need to move out to Bangalore or uh, even Chennai is only recently it's uh, it's improving. Like otherwise even Chennai... Um, uh, it's become the SaaS capital for India. Yeah, now it became <laughs> a SaaS capital. Uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, I think, you know, like uh, people... Definitely to answer your original question, I would have stayed in Coimbatore because at that age, it's a very hard decision to move out of your hometown because, you know, you have a lot of memories, you build up your friendship, you have network, everything. And that at that young age, you're breaking everything and then all of a sudden you're going. For me, at age of 22, I went to uh, London. To study? No, straight work. Okay. You know, like... Uh, 
we can talk about that uh, you know this straight my friday finished my exam monday morning i got a jo- i was work supposed to join in uh, london and how did that happen would love to know that right how did you got a opportunity to work because uh, the way i did my studies was in uh, 94 to 97 i did my bsc in electronics the full time college from kambatur i had in kambatur all in kambatur and 97 to 2000 i did my mca in cor- yes. correspondence not not college and at the same time i was working for a company out of uh, kambatur so by 2000 you know even though i was just graduating my masters mca i got 3 years experience and uh, since i was very passionate about uh, computers and uh, uh, maybe i would have had like you know like 7 uh, years worth of experience to the outside world in the amount of learnings yeah. you had in the 3 years just uh, you know that time it was a peak dot com and uh, y2k was also there but i i, I got more on the dot com side and uh, i had an interview and uh, cleared it and then straight i i got a job uh, to join in london uh, so you said friday you got a job and monday you were supposed to be <laughs> no i got the job earlier i gave my exams and then friday i gave my mc exams mc exams i don't even know the results and weekend i flew to okay. london yeah I, i i said it's a bit fortunate thing happened uh, i i've i think there's a lot of uh, good things happened uh, we discussed about the young childhood so that helped played a significant part and going to london at a young age also uh, because the exposure right like uh, at that time when you look at 20 years ago the exposure in india was very minimal you know even if you come to bangalore that's that's when bangalore was picking up with uh, all yeah. the foreign investments and companies were coming and setting up and everything uh, even then i don't think the the first party work would have come to india you know it, it will be like uh, some some back office kind of work was uh, picking up so moving to uh, london and straight into some very innovative projects uh, i was working with microsoft uh, germany within 6 months so so a part of a project and uh, and it was collaboration with microsoft germany and we are doing something all happened when you were 22 and you know that exposure helped significantly as well for you to kick start uh, much earlier so the talent is getting its due worth in india yeah. that's you are saying right so for high salaries you don't need to move outside yeah sal- salary alone is not a criteria anymore you know like if you're good there are uh, above one c is uh, pretty normal yeah, we have a lot of people yeah. and Uh, then why would still people are like say every year eight thousand people in India give up the citizenship and these are we are talking about H and I's people who make pay good taxes. Mm. Okay, the other thing is the India still struggles to be the fair answer is India still struggles with a lot of other factors, right? Like uh, it's not uh, that's okay. You have money, and this one. one kind of enjoyment is there with all the mates and quality of sure. life the, the other side is still a problem for example i like cars and you know for me to enjoy those kind of infrastructure it's uh, not possible here yeah uh, if people want to travel in europe or you know like uh, it's a it's a definitely you know there's a both plus and minus and it'll come down to individual's preference i have seen people moving from us and uk back and happily uh, living here and at the same time i've seen people who are there and struggling a lot yeah. because uh, uh i have friend circle where you know they need to think two times before going to a nice restaurant and they, you know like uh, uh, so i'll say it'll come it'll come down to individual preferences what you want to do like god and generally as, as part of koi right you you are trying to create the silicon valley inside coimbatore yeah right so you have invested i think 1.3 million dollars in the office that you created correct yeah. uh, uh, there uh, what what does life today looks looks for a, for your employee in a tier 2 city um when it come to work and workplace i don't it will be exactly how you will your uh, environment will be if you're working in uh, any city in uh, in the bangalore or uh, you know we really do want to take that equation out we don't want to uh, because uh, uh, when when we started this project like uh, setting up a new office uh, in 2019 is when we made this big decision let's uh, go big and do it uh, the one of the the first criteria for me is okay 
let's make sure like uh, whatever people get on bangalore and uh, hyderabad or whatever let's replicate that uh, infrastructure structure here and all the facilities and everything what you will get it for co employees i'm pretty sure uh, uh, the the work life is pretty identical they, they won't miss out like uh, not only just the the nice to have things like office and those kind of things even work wise we do cutting edge thing and we constantly focus on whether we are doing something innovative because i feel i'm coming from a technical background i feel that is very important for uh, tech guys and also that's where all this work life balance comes in like if you really enjoy what you are doing then uh, that uh, you know everything is taken care of you know and all aspects i feel that is what we really wanted to replicate in uh, in coimbatore and also want to set some kind of you know like a Uh, benchmark like for others to, because it's that uh, that uh, marathon not marathon the one mile uh, barrier right once the first guy broke it then everybody does it that's also our hope you know once somebody somebody need to do it right okay let's be that somebody to break it yeah and uh, i was speaking to to one of your leadership person right he told me like sarona is very quiet on the outside but very aggressive <laughs> while doing work like right? quietly aggressive right you will never raise your voice right folks have never seen you raising your voice but whatever you tell in couple of sentences people would have to write six pages to execute it <laughs> <laughs> how is that possible right how do you you do at that speed i think i i don't i think maybe it's just a natural characteristics i will say like uh, you know like a uh, i'm generally i you know i i love i can openly admit i'm more a uh, introvert uh, person if you put me in a group of people and uh, if you have like a uh, two really extrovert people then i'll go quiet completely at the same time i think that's a natural characteristics of introverts i guess they typically listen more and then more action oriented ra- rather than yeah. keep talking a lot maybe that is what uh, transforming here um you know like i'm very firm on uh, on what we need to achieve and i think the communication is also very important like you communicate very clearly within a short uh, sentence a short paragraph this is what we wanted to execute and then you know like uh, make sure the the other person understands your expectations and then uh, uh, also keep telling like uh, you know like uh, uh, with the lead lot of the leadership people like uh, there is a difference between uh, um delegation um and the other i don't there's a word for it it's a uh, dumping everything to the sure. person and uh, and moving it i don't do that you know i i work uh, very closely with that person until they settle down and uh, uh, my management team um i invested a lot on uh, building that chemistry between uh, between us so i can open i can i only need to say a couple of uh, sentences they understand exactly like uh, what's my expectation and then they can be do it but that didn't come magically you know the, the investment was there in the uh, in the front like you know i would do one to ones every week with them and then go through what they're doing and ex- ex- uh, explain my expectations so it's just building that bond and then it becomes uh, easy to do that yeah but but do people face a hard time matching your speed um yeah i think our founders uh, got lot of expectations yeah. like when it comes to product we want everything today you know like it's a, i'm i'm also realistic as well you know like uh, when it comes to tech you since i'm coming from a more tech background you understand the challenges and uh, you you're realistic with that it's not unreasonable expectations like you know like whatever it's uh, it's possible yeah and do they face a process like a lot of leaders have said a chat gpt and ai in the in the us will kill many indian startups is it true i i don't think it's uh, it's true because uh, nobody under, nobody knows the the type of uh, applications uh, it can evolve uh, you know in the last uh, few months like so many new startups all came out based on this ai and chat gpt thing whether it will kill the entire thing it's it's a uh, doubtful there will be impact and you know any Uh, any event there will always be winners and losers even we take covid right uh, there's a bunch of companies who scaled exponentially well yeah. due to covid zoom is a good example they went into multi billion valuation because of covid and of course there's a lot of businesses yeah. suffered and died 
So any, because that is how the world operates, right? You need to have these kind of events that comes continuously and that's what uh, resets everything. Otherwise, it can't be stable or it can be going only up. The world doesn't go grow linear. Exactly. It can't be linear. You need to have some disruptions yeah. happening. And uh, it all comes down to which side of the equation yeah. you are when that uh, when that happens. Whether it will kill uh, Indian as uh, one threat I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of seeing is today, a uh, lot of Indian uh, startups are driven more like a inbound driven. Basically, you know, like uh, the playbook is general playbook is uh, you build a product and then you do SEO and then you go uh, generate organic leads and then build inside sales teams and then you close it. That is a, that's the most successful playbook. You know, the others are all very, you know, the outbound and yeah. ABM things are very lean. So nobody knows what impact will have on, on the chat GPT and the organic. Uh, the, why, yeah. why, why, why is there a relationship between organic inbound and chat GPT? Because if you look at uh, today, Google search, right? Google itself, there is a, there's a question, you know, will the existence of Google still relevant anymore? You know, like, uh, why is that? Um, Okay, how does the how does the inbound work, right? You let's say we got a product document three hundred and sixty, and somebody is going to search for I am looking for a knowledge based software, and then our goal is to rank as high as possible on the first on page the of first Google. Page, not even first page. We want to go on the first three to yeah. because nobody looks after that yeah. third or fourth result. You you want to be there, and they click and then they come to your site, and that is where you have like a landing page. Uh, based on their keyword, you wanted to uh, make sure like they're, what they're searching and what your product is uh, matching their requirements. And then the, 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 the prospects gets interested and then they potentially sign up for your free trial or free sure. and then, then that's a playbook. But today they're not coming to you. They, the, the, the traffic stops there, you know, the, within chat GPT, it stops. It gives you, it ripped off your uh, answers from your wow. site, right? And then it's actually, it serves there and that user is not coming here. Only when they come here, you can actually do the rest of the journey and conversion. That 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 part, I think it's still, nobody knows what will happen to that part. So you think, for example, let's say there are a billion Google searches every day. Yeah. Chat GPT will reduce it significantly? The searches may still be there because people need uh, answers for mm. their questions. But the searches coming the to your your property, you know, that will cut off. If that cuts off... And, and why is that? I just want to reiterate again. Why it will cut off? Before. Because, okay, I am assuming you're using chat GPT, yeah, right? Yeah. You go and you ask questions. You are you're only living within the chat GPT window. Yeah. You're not coming to... But the answer is actually coming from uh, Document 360's uh, 10 blogs. Yeah. It condensed everything. It has taken it. And then it's actually giving you all the answers there. If the user is not really... Okay... This only this small thing you can do is maybe, you know, there is a recommendation by chat GPT. Okay, Document 360 is the best tool for you to do that. That is the only thing. But they're actually your conversation stops there. You're not bringing them to this side. So that is what uh, I see it as a, as a challenge. Another question that I have is, uh, and I keep on wondering about this, right? India's SaaS industry got created in the last 13 years. And everybody has benefited from the guardrails and ecosystem that Soho Freshworks built in Chennai and now what you are building in Coimbatore, right? And now hopefully we'll see many more startups coming from Coimbatore because you have set an example. But India hasn't produced anything of the scale of Microsoft, Salesforce, right? Even like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud. Do you think this can be solved in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah, I think that will happen like, you know, uh, the way I look at it is, you know, like uh, if you if you take it back to 95 and 96 period where there was no IT uh, in India, right? Uh, that is when uh, the IT boom started to come and then uh, uh, all the consulting companies, they they captured that wave, uh, Infosys, Wave, Proteus, and uh, all those companies captured yeah. the wave and the twin in the, the the 20 years from 2000 to 2010, 12, something like that, they capitalized on that and they all became billion dollar companies and uh, the first New York uh, NYSE IPO, Infosys, all these things happened. 
and that created a talent pool uh, because of uh, uh, and those talent pool is what now turning into the second generation and now rather than going into that consulting route which is kind of saturated now and now they are returning it into product companies and uh, we always you know like uh, uh, there's no concept of real product uh, companies in the last 20 years zoho was doing it very quietly and they cracked it and probably they didn't you know like uh, expose themselves too much and then they quietly build that thing uh you know they maybe uh, sridhar uh, was able to learn it from us and he has come back and started it i think maybe in the next 20 years we will see something like uh, the next wave like you know now we are building products it's all about now how do you build a large scale products like salesforce and microsoft it will happen eventually it will happen because this talent pool now they understand like uh, uh, how to build product and how to build in, in not, not even build in India, build in one place, but scale it across the globe. They understand the playbook and they're doing it. I think eventually we will see, uh, even today, I think, you know, companies like Freshworks are a good example. Like, you know, like a SaaS company going IPO is, is a big thing. Like, you know, a product company going IPO is a big thing. Uh, eventually, at some point, we, we definitely we will see. Uh, today, I think uh, uh, we are competing with everybody, right? And, uh, and also what I see is uh, the... The technology side is sorted now. Today, you can build a Salesforce. Building Salesforce is not a problem. Only the GTM part is uh, is the problem because that is what uh, we are lagging yeah. because we didn't learn the playbook in the last 20 years. Yeah. So only technology part we learn. Now people creating the farm, you know, small companies and the GTM motions are uh, learned. And the next step will be like, uh, um, um, at some point we will see. And also the, the other thing what I'm seeing is... Uh, um all the the tech ceos of these large firms are all uh, indian driven and they all have some softer edges to you know build india and uh, i'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, founders uh, the investments are you know more like uh, not on the money making side but giving it back to pay pay it forward even saas bhumi you know like a lot of motions happening uh, then those knowledge will also you know uh, i'm pretty sure Satyas and Sundars will be guiding a lot of those companies in India now, you know, like, uh, and eventually we will see something big happening. Yeah. Is, is it a hope or is, is, it, is it a fact-based statement? It is fact. I think it, it will happen. It's a, everything takes time, right? You know, yeah. like uh, from where we started, from where we are, yeah. it's a 10, 15 years. It's a long, long-term game. And I think eventually we will, we will, we will see like uh, something bigger. Yeah. So, uh, two questions that, you know, this conversation brings me to. What are the things that Indian founders, especially SaaS founders, need to unlearn to create Salesforce of the world? Think big. You know, that's a, the that's a number one thing. Uh, because most of the time, I think a uh, lot of uh, early stage SaaS founders, I think uh, they are... Uh, uh, they're very confined, you know, like this is so just to build a small product or a small niche and then uh, uh, make, a, make a product out of it. Uh, if you want to create sales forces and others, you need to think something like a massive TAM and massive uh, uh, market. Uh, that's very hard, you know, like uh, uh, that will come only through experience because you can't just jump and create a sales force immediately, right? And now we are seeing a lot of uh, serial entrepreneurs. You know, they found uh, the first company and then second company. Um, Nutanix is a good example, right? You know, uh, Nutanix and then uh, now they're building dev revs. Imagine yeah. like they're two big uh, ones and even there's a stepping stone, right? Like uh, they, they might be doing something. I don't know, dev rev could be Salesforce equivalent or disrupting Salesforce. You, you never know, right? Uh, yeah. And that leads to my second question. The world of software has never been so much crowded as it is. For everything that you need to solve, there are 10 or maybe 100 solutions, right? And there are a limited number of enterprise customers, mid-market that are there. How do you, first, now, when you started Koi, the GTM was simple. You wrote a blog and whenever customers either found you because there was not too much, uh, you know, you found a... The, the gap in Microsoft serverless. BizTalk Biz Biz yeah. serverless. And people, and you were constantly writing. So people who found you, right? And 
you could say on just on the blog that hey this is the problem that is in household and i think there is a example also that somebody in hong kong said this is exactly what i want yeah but today there would be hundreds of companies writing content hundreds of companies doing events how do you differentiate and how do you reach out to those customers yeah i think uh, one of the challenge because of all this explosive growth one of the challenges uh, building software become almost a commodity now anybody can uh, build anything uh, you know like uh, thanks to all the cloud providers like aws and uh, because uh, 15 20 years ago if you wanted to host something at this scale you know like uh, your initial investment will be like a few 100000 dollars not 100000 few thousand dollars to get started but today even you start you can start for free to get that yeah. that kind of scale but uh, this also created a negative effect on the customer acquisition because everybody there's too much noise in the market and it becomes so hard to stand out in the in the in the crowd uh having said that you know like uh, uh there's still opportunities out there uh, if if you are like you know uh, the one way you can do it is like uh, if you're in a very specific niche uh, that target audience will be very limited that is exactly how we were able to do the first product bistock server bistock 360 is a product for a microsoft server product called bistock server there were only 10000 customers for microsoft for that particular product so nobody is actually looking after those 10000 people you know when you find out niches like that is basically uh and yeah when we started writing when we started helping those uh, companies out there and we were able to connect and uh, connect and do it and uh, you know people come and ask me for advice you know what what is the gtm strategy what can i do if you look at it you know there are not that many you know it's only like seven or eight channels available for us you know uh, and it's all about uh, execution uh, uh, rather than just to uh, keep talking about it like uh, people like you know they i i still think you know the blogging and stuff will work as long as we we have the consistency and the quality of content people even though there's a lot of noise they still finding quality content is uh, is okay. difficult as chat gpt is improving the bar for quality content uh, has to improve else you don't know today what content is written by a machine and what is by human and if somebody wants to produce content they can produce using chat gpt hundreds of thousands of articles at scale no absolutely because uh, today you know i started uh, something in linkedin called uh, life of a ceo i do, I do talk about uh, um, i'm very clear i don't want to put like a uh, generic advice post because too many everybody giving advice now right everybody like all the power, you know too much noise <laughs> everybody became like you know like whether they have done it or not too much advice in linkedin so yeah. very particular unless otherwise if i can relate to my personal story you know i have done something this what this is what happened i don't write about it so the, then that resonates extremely well with the people because it's a true story and a true yeah. value as long as you write a quality content it's still there all this channel will work depending on you know your market your customer base your understanding of your uh, customer base etc and i don't think you know that, that that's all available basically you know like uh, the seven or eight channels it's all about how you execute it and one thing as a, as a leader right uh, i don't know how how do you do it i would love to dive deep into it that do you show your employees only your strengths or you also show your vulnerabilities i'm very transparent uh, with my uh, in the company like i speak to everybody you know like there is no hierarchy in terms of you know like i even interns and everything and i try to be as transparent uh, as possible uh, a, you know like a vulnerability in the sense you know there are certain things like uh, the founder's journey is always lonely and you uh, you you can't disclose everything with uh, everybody that yeah. part is there always there even certain things you can't even talk to your uh, sure. first level management people certain things you need to digest yourself those things i go outwards like you know like i go find fellow founders or advisors to sure. go with but internally i would like to you know keep it very uh, as transparent as possible um you know like uh, yeah i i think since and even before because you mentioned you were so passionate you would have 70 or 100 working hours per week 
throughout your life yeah uh, and mr narayan murthy has said right youngsters need to work 70 hours per per week is it only true for ambitious folks or is it just true that if india needs to build that needs to be the norm like china like jack ma once quoted <laughs> very early like it was i think 24 by 7 uh something yeah yeah i did uh, read that uh, thing and it's going viral now i think now everybody is uh, doing some linkedin post related sure. to that right it uh, depends on how you see it you know uh, in my case i'm sure like you know like uh, I'll, i'll i'll tell my pattern i i get up at 4:30 in the morning every day that's my regular uh, routine 4:30 to 7:30 i do my core work and then by 9 o'clock i go to office and then up to 5 i work and come back and then i might do bits and pieces here and there so if you out of this how do you classify your hours right you know like uh, uh if you look at it the entire thing as a work then probably you are doing like a 14 hours a day work even But weekends for you yeah weekends are same you know like because as a founder you don't switch off you yeah. know 24/7 you're always uh, thinking uh, on the other hand what i believe is you know everybody got only like 4 to 5 hours of uh, mental power to do something useful the remaining things are all only can do supportive uh, yeah. work so that is where i build up this habit of getting up early in the morning 4:30 to 7:30 is my peak hours you know uh, i read a book long time ago i think your 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 brain at work uh, everybody got a sweet spot 3 uh, to 4 hours so some people it's early morning some people we call night owls right only after 10 o'clock they become productive so that's the core hours where you know you'll be productive and the remaining things are all like uh, supportive work and i think in a knowledge worker segment uh, this work life balance uh, if you need to find a job which you are really passionate about i think that is the key rather than looking it other way around whether i want to work for uh, so many so many hours once you find the passion then it's it's actually part of your role you know like okay you do some work there is something personal you go and then you know you come back and continue you need to carry on like uh, you can't turn off you know but, certain professions it might work out for example a bank employee right uh, where a teller in the cash counter or something if you ask him to do 14 hours a day that's a real work i see a lot of things you know like uh, aero stresses right you know you it's it's unfair if you tell them you know you work uh, 70 hours a week it's impossible because that's a real work physical work mental work but uh, you need to understand the context if you are in this side no more like a knowledge and thinking you can't just turn off and say okay i'm turning off 6 o'clock and i'll turn back on by 10 o'clock next day morning it doesn't work so it's all about finding your balance and uh, you need to have a you need to enjoy your life you know at the end of the day why do you want to work right you need to have a balance so don't just look at the headlines you know understand the context because i had two i saw two different arguments i'd say i think one one side in a whatsapp group people were blaming this and then you know even somebody said rude word like idiot and those kind of things but you need to understand the context if somebody if you don't want to do it's fine you know it's up to you uh, but if you really want to be ambitious and uh, grow faster uh, uh, you need to put your efforts yeah. yeah opportunities won't wait yeah you know you miss the window it's gone you know like now you are india is in the right place you know the talent pool is there most of our talent are you know 20s and 30s and if you miss that window uh, somebody will take it you know china capitalized on it right like uh, today they became a superpower and uh, we keep complaining about india and this is not there that is not there it's a, it's a collective effort you know if every the mindset switches um then you know it's it's fruitful for everybody in the, in the long run yeah and i want to come back to to a few things that we spoke earlier right about people moving from uh, let's say india to us now there is another movement which happened a lot right in the last four years bangalore has seen the highest migration mm. ever that's why the roads are so crowded <laughs> even i blame myself because i'm also a migrant yeah. from north india to to bangalore do you think this this will continue like people from small cities like coimbatore and 
why that will keep on coming to bangalore for no i don't think so i think it will i feel it's eventually it will slow down uh, because uh, people everybody now they understand uh, what are the challenges of moving some to bangalore the quality of life definitely it suffered uh, for everybody right uh, simple things uh, travel like uh, even uh, you know like i i've been caught up in this few times the google map says 5 kilometers <laughs> and i thought okay it takes one, <laughs> it takes one hour, one hour. <laughs> you know like uh, anywhere you know you once you step out of the house you need uh, 45 minutes yeah. to one hour for you to go from a to b how you know whatever the distance uh, it's not ideal you know like for anything like uh, most of the time you end up sitting at home and you don't want to step yeah. out uh, because uh, uh, at the same time uh, the tier 2 cities are uh, developing you know coimbatore for example it's a, it's a booming but also i have a concern like will it turn into another bangalore in 10 years you know uh, this is where the governments need to step in they don't they shouldn't they learned from mistakes because Uh, Bangalore grown too fast too quick you know like uh, they couldn't react it, it was like Bangalore growth. on steroids yeah exactly everything it was on steroid right like uh, uh, all the way from airport to here like a one hour journey it's it's full busy you know like all big buildings malls and everything it's just on was on steroid uh, maybe they should learn and they shouldn't repeat the same mistakes in in tier 2 cities now because it's a good time to Uh, build up that infrastructure and uh, make sure the regulations are there uh, because in in uk you know you know like uh, if if you are building a thousand you, you can't build thousand apartments in the first place you know it will be like if you are building 100 <laughs> apartments in a road they will check everything whether the transport facilities are there whether the in and out uh, traffic is there how many cars will be there for each apartment Uh, what will be the water supply required for that and everything is evaluated but here i think uh, uh, in a small road where there is a road room for only couple of cars you know you build like uh, 500 apartments on the other side it's it's going to be congested so i think uh, uh, the government probably need to step in and uh, make sure that it's not repeated yeah in right. india if i think you know uh, when I, if, if, if somebody gives me a choice you have exactly same career prospects and what you can do in one place versus the other and if, whether you want to take bangalore or coimbatore i will take uh, coimbatore at current moment uh, because a uh, uh, commute is fairly easy and then the, even the weather and pollution and everything is uh, is is good compared yeah, to airport bangalore. is there's a airport in coimbatore. there is an airport and uh, the only downside what i see in uh, coimbatore at the moment is it's uh, the international connection is not there there are only couple of flights on to singapore and one to our sharja uh, it's, it's nowhere it's a connection because i will comfortably i can reach chennai or bangalore or uh, even cochin within 10 hours i can reach but it will take another 6 7 hours for me to go from chennai to coimbatore that's what will make it really tiring uh, but i was thinking you know if they connect either coimbatore to dubai all the problems will be solved yeah. you know that's so that's the only one connection they want need uh, apart from that yeah it's it's good i think that will solve a lot of it problems also like how indian it cities got created was even hyderabad and bangalore they solved international travel yeah first for these cities correct if they solve this for for towns like coimbatore vizag i think a lot of the companies would be happy to move there because of cost structure and indian it operates on the cost arbitrage correct correct yeah i think yeah definitely i think the, the international travel is one can say i'm a bit surprised with coimbatore because uh, um the, the tripur which is nearby uh, it's not an it but it's like you know like a uh, massive textile hub for the whole world um, bit surprised they don't have a good international uh, connection because every time when i'm doing that travel from coimbatore chennai to coimbatore i will see at least in you know few expats all the time yeah yeah so how many saas companies today would be in coimbatore not uh, that many um the, the only two known companies one is uh, us and the other one is uh, responsive um, um at a reasonable scale uh, but a lot of small ones are coming but notable ones uh, we don't have that many at the moment yeah I, i hope this get change in the next 10 years right yeah. because as i think uh, if you can share what what numbers you are at and then we can talk about the future of koi 
Yes, sure. We are in a, a 10 to 20 million dollar journey now. Yeah. Uh, 10 is actually a bit old number. It's our 2020 number, but uh, that's a public number. We are in that journey. Uh, uh, I think uh, one of the long term plan is uh, uh, whether we can create a hundred million dollar company by 2030 is what okay. uh, we are uh, looking at uh, multi products and then uh, scale to that level. Uh, and I think we are hopeful we will be able to achieve that and uh, all the uh, fo- focus and directions sure. are in that. Yeah. And do you also plan to go for IPO? Um, I won't say we have like a, you know, solid ambitions. We are not looking like looking like a, that is an end goal sure. uh, because IPO is not really an end goal, uh, right? Because uh, running a public company is a completely different ballgame. People miss on at least from the normal employee perspective, it might uh, work out well. But a founder perspective, your whole journey starts once you get an IPO, right? Yeah. Uh, I've seen people like Girish, you know, like uh, it's not the end game. It's just, uh, you know, that's where you start. Yeah. You might get an exit at that point, but uh, the journey begins. At, the, at this moment, you know, like uh, uh, we are looking only at the revenue prospect, milestone. revenue milestone, yeah. But... Uh, what I believe is an ecosystem only gets created once as a certain company hits and Freshworks has demonstrated that, right? It's the scale of a large public listing because a lot of people got financial independence created huge. Like it's a yeah. uh, number that almost 100 people got into dollar millionaires, right? Which sure. is 8 crore rupees per person across 100 people yeah. and more, right? Right. So, and today there are 30 companies that have started out of Freshworks. Fresh work, yeah. For, I think, 30 companies to start out of Koi, that's what number I'm a- aiming at. No, that's true. But I also believe, you know, IPO may not be the only way to distribute sure. wealth. Uh, it, because we have structures in place and we are also constantly evaluating how to redistribute wealth within the company. Um, imagine like... Uh, if you can reach 100 million revenue with 500 employees, right? So then uh, you can distribute the uh, same level of wealth without going uh, IPO as well. So right. that is how that is how I, I see it, uh, one way to do it. Because IPO comes with its own uh, challenges as well, right? It's not a straightforward yeah. game, right? If distributing wealth is the only thing, you know, uh, I don't think uh, IPO is the only choice. Yeah. Uh, the, I think the only challenge with IPO is every time you have a new set of stakeholders, investors, they come with their own different set of expectations. For example, even in the case of startup, right, you take a seed check from a fund like us yeah. and you then go to series A, you have a different set of investors, right? You go to series B, series C, right? So there are new kind of... And IPO is the base that exposes you to everybody. Now Correct. everybody can... You can have millions of shareholders. Absolutely. So now... For your company, that might be a 20-year journey to go to IPO. But for these shareholders, it's day zero in your company. No, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I understand. But I think in, in a, maybe I'm coming from a more like a bootstrapped model. Uh, I'm sure like, you know, like uh, if you're on a 100 million ARR with 500 people, I, I mentioned somewhere like I don't want to, the idea is not to build a large company in terms of Headcount. It's not about, five thousand member. Exactly. Company. <laughs> Definitely, I don't want that. Uh, uh, I, I always keep telling internally as well. Like we are more a tech, and uh, we need to focus more on uh, more efficient company rather than like a headcount. And uh, with with that kind of a number, if we can hit uh, big milestones, um, the wealth can be distributed uh, easily. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, sir. And I would love to keep on talking and talking. Maybe for the next episode, I'll, I'll <laughs> have some more points to discuss with you. But thank you so much. Uh, it's been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Siddhartha, for having me. It was a really great and it's a good conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks.